Good evening, everyone. Um, it really is lovely to see each and every face here tonight. And I feel really privileged to not only be at this youth camp, but to have the opportunity to share with you all um, this year's youth camp themes, relevance, and really the need for God's love to fill my heart. So as you all should know by now, the theme is um, Do Not Love the World. And it is taken from 1 John 2 verse 15, where it reads, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Um, You know, as I thought about this, what does it mean to love the world? What was it that John was warning us to stop loving? Um, Pastor Chris mentioned that it's not just the physical world, the materialistic things, but it's the world system, the way the world thinks, the way the world, um, the ways of the world, sorry, and the influence of the world. You know, maybe you aren't drawn to the physical aspects, like the the latest cars or technology. Um, But, you know, it could be the world system. And it could be something as genuine as striving for success, but at the expense of keeping God's ways. You know, a way that I have seen sin in my past would be how I carry myself um, through my reactions. You know, it was so subtle and no one might even think anything of it but God does, and that's the most important thing. You know, perhaps you can see it in your life or in your past as well, and it would be how I react to the things that uh, hurt me or that appeared against me. So just by a show of hands, has anyone heard of the saying or the phrase, you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? If you have, just put your hand up. (laughs) Yeah, good, okay, I'm glad, because I was was talking to uh, my Vespers group, and they're a lot younger, and I asked them, do you know? And they're like, I've never heard of that. I was like, really? Like, I'm not that old. I'm only 20, surely. But just then, they were all like, I know it now. So, yeah. Um, you know, it is a common phrase that's associated with uh, hurt or revenge. Um, but, you know, it's metaphorical, of course. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But the mentality of it is, if you hurt me, I'll hurt you back. And this is a really worldly approach to undesired happenings. And, you know, with my human logic, I would justify and I would reason in my mind that it's okay to respond like this. You know, it's only a reasonable response. How else would they expect me to feel? And, you know, what Pastor Chris said this morning is really true. What we say, the words we say, you know, it really tells you about your person. And this was my sinful way of thinking, the, the world's way of thinking and the world's way of reacting to things. And uh, although I, lit- I wouldn't literally, sorry, go out and you know, take somebody's eye or someone's tooth, I had already sinned in my heart. In Matthew 5, verse 38 to 42, you know, Jesus himself, uh, who says, we have heard this saying, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But instead of encouraging this, you know, Christ tells us to do otherwise. So it reads, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to to him also. If anyone wants to see you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. And you know what a heart of love he really has. It wasn't just a nice saying he said and then didn't follow through, but he really kept them. You know, he doesn't say if someone slaps you, slap them back. Instead, you know, he practices love and he practices forgiveness. And a wonderful example that I look to is how Christ loved Judas. You know, knowing that he would betray him, knowing that he would hurt him, he still showed love. And, you know, it takes such a great capacity of love to do that. You know, to me, it's so clear the difference between God's ways and the world's ways. And it is my focus that God will continue to fill my heart with his love, and I will desire to keep his commandments and walk in his ways, not the world's. The first song I'd like to sing this evening is The Love of God. This song has a really powerful um, and truthful imagery about how immeasurable God's love is. You know, the imagery I really appreciate um, is from the last verse, and it's it sings, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. You know, if you were to try and write out God's love, it would drain the oceans dry. I did a little Google and 
according to the estimate from Google, there is about 352 quintillion gallons of water that covers the Earth's surface. And you know, the pens that you got <laughs> at orientation, they have about 0 0.3 mils of ink. And you know, just this, this is like a, give you an estimate or a conversion, one gallon is 3,785.41 mils. And I can't even figure out the 352 quintillion to milliliters. But you know, can you imagine just trying to write out God's love? You'll be writing for like generations and generations, and it wouldn't even be a sufficient description of God's love. And this is just a physical imagery that really puts into an accurate perspective how immeasurable his love for us is. And it really encourages my heart to know that this is the kind of God who is by our side. And with these thoughts, I would like to sing our first song this evening, um, The Love of God. I'm just going to invite some of the committee to help me sing. Thank you. So dealing with sin and its severity is never an easy thing. It, it's definitely a challenge for myself. Um, because, you know, who wants to admit their wrongs and who wants to admit their weaknesses? Um, during discussion group after YPG, the younger girls and myself were discussing the internal fight that goes on um, to overcome sin. And, you know, this year, sometime throughout this year, there was a really iconic um, phrase that was coined by youth. And it was, like, the struggle. Or, and, you know, there were, like, memes created about it. Like, the struggle is real. I'm sure most people have heard, most youths, I'm not sure about the adults, but most youths would have heard, you know, the struggle is real. And, you know, this is how we felt about sin at that time. You know, the struggle is real. We were speaking really candidly about, you know, how weak we actually are, and it's evident in how easily and how quickly we can sin. You know, the sin doesn't have to be saying unkind words aloud, but it can be thinking those unkind things just wrong thoughts is how easily we can sin. Um, in 1 John verse, chapter 2, verse 16, it reads, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And it doesn't have to be when you give in to the lusts of the flesh, but even the lusts of the eyes. <coughs> you know, it is the Bible that tells us if we desire and we lust after the things of the world, worldly things, you know, then the love of the Father will not be in you. And it isn't an easy task, and there are definitely challenges ahead, but I know that all of God's ways are right, and I know that all of his ways are good. And, you know, this challenges me to focus on following his ways and not the world's. The second song I chose for this evening is one that Michelle chose last night, and it was called Always. And I really appreciate this new song, because the lyrics are a prayer that I also make, that God would teach me and help me to follow and obey him always. And I'm not just giving all the right answers, like the people in 1 John 1, but genuinely making God's ways a part of my life. So I'm going to invite the um, praise team to help me sing this song. And may it be a prayer that you make too with a sincere heart. You know, it really is only the Lord that will satisfy us. Um, I remember a morning message from an IPC family camp where Pastor Charlie asked the question, how much would you be willing to trade your soul for your soul? You know, what is the cost of your soul? And the Bible points out in um, Matthew 16, verse 26, you know, what do you really profit if you gained everything that you desired in the world um, only to lose your soul at the end? You know, if you had wealth or fame or success, and the most expensive cars and technology, or like you were really into K-pop and you got to meet them, or, you know, these desires, you know, is it worth it? You know, the attractions for such things really manifest from the love that we could have for the world and for the things in the world. And, you know, these are all things that people desire. People, you know, they put in time and money and effort into obtaining during their time on earth. But the truth is that all of these things are passing. And to me, it really isn't worth it. You know, I would be saying that the value of my soul is a house or the value of my soul is fame. I desire to follow Christ and the example that he has set before us. And I know that he has conquered sin and he has overcome the world. In Matthew 16, verse 24, Jesus says, If anyone desires to come after me, 
let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, it isn't just follow me and that's it. You know, Jesus tells us we have to first deny ourselves um, from the worldly drawers before we can follow him. We can't follow the world and him at the same time. And this is God's clear instruction to us, you know, to deny ourselves and to rely on God's strength and his truths to overcome sin as Christ has. You know, I don't want to look at sin and its challenges and just be overwhelmed with the struggle or mentally defeated before I even begin. But I look to Jesus and I know that in him, I have a definite hope. I know that God has a plan for me and that it isn't to harm me, but to prosper me. May Christ's example encourage us to press on even when it is really difficult because we know that it is possible to overcome it. And, you know, it's already Wednesday night and as we draw near the end of camp, whether we return back to work or to school, to high school or to uni, um, you know, as the trials in life come and as, you know, sin is in the world, may we always remember that we have this hope in Christ, um, in God, sorry. So can I call the praise to Mott? Thank you. To sing our last song together. Thank you, praise singers, and thank you, Auntie Aldean. I'll pass the time to Pastor Chris. Okay, I, I, that's a really nice song. I'm wondering whether you want to um, sing that for pre-worship. Yeah, let's, you know, almost, almost, almost the church is here anyway. So you all learn already. <laughs> and then on Sunday, you sing it. Really, let's introduce new songs into the church. It's just so uplifting to sing new songs. You learn them, get to enjoy them, hear the Lord's word, respond with it. Okay, of course, I'm going to need this team to, to lead again, and they're doing well. You know, just so many things to give thanks, to thank God for. And these are things we treasure and treasure it. Okay, so um, every time I, uh, before anything, I look at, you know, the board tells you the menu. I, I look at it all the time. I, I thought it's beautifully done. Uh, Joanna, Joanna is the one who uh, writes it and draws pictures. So I look forward every time, not just to see the food, you know. That just to look at the calligraphy, the, the pictures that she do. So every time I'm just looking what, what else is going, she's going to do. And, and that just brings me little joy. I, you, know, you, you don't have such joy? I feel sorry for you. Maybe you look forward, why, what are we going to eat? I look for that too because, see, when I see it, I, my heart sinks. Okay, right? The messages have been intense. What do you think has to be intense? Because you eat so intensively. I have to match you. Otherwise, you fall asleep. You are so good. Wow, you are, you are, you are, wow, wow. And, and, you, and enjoy it. But I, I look at it and... That is a full menu there, and you are very full. And you're already looking full, heavy in the eyes, already, and we haven't started. Right? So why do you think the messages are intensive? For, because of you, right? But, you know, uh, really, as we look at this theme, uh, I hope we are learning something valuable, precious from the Lord's Word. I certainly am. Okay, all right, well, let's take up our text again. You should know this text by now, okay? If not, tomorrow you have one last chance, and then camp is over. 1 John 2.15, okay, recite it without stumbling. Great, you know, you you one text, you know, that you can recite, and this is an important text that must remind you as you go back into the world. Ah, oh, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father will not be in him. It must warn us. Okay, so you know, we have been looking at this first night, the dangers. And there are many dangers that we don't realize that is in the world. It can affect children. 
It affects parents. It affects, of course, young people. What are some of these dangers? Now, I have been working with you on 1 John, reading 1 John. But in fact, my first draft of the messages covered more than John. It was taking up from Paul to Ecclesiastes to Proverbs. In fact, it's all scripture. But I thought, better not. Just appreciate John. But all the other apostles and writers write about the dangers of the world too. Okay? Take, for example, 1 Peter. Peter also warned the believers concerning the world. Okay? Now, 1 Peter chapter 4. <clears throat> Okay, now let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Now, therefore, we read, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, and he says, arm yourself also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. See, sometimes you have to have to experience this affliction for you to... You've gone out there, the pain is there, you stop. Wisely so. And, right? And so we read that he no longer should live like the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men. Okay? So the lust of the flesh, in other words. And he was burnt by it. And he was afflicted. And he stopped. Now, we read. But for the will of God, now, no longer live the rest of his time, you won't want to go back to it. Why would you do that? You change. Rather, to live for the lust of the flesh, you change the will of God. And then he says, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, which is the will of those who are of the world. Right? When we walk in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, rivalries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatry. Now, this is a description of the activities of the world. Drinking parties. Now, and you look at it today, no difference. The same problem is today. And we're talking about a few thousand years ago. It's just different form. The problem of it still applies today. Now, verse 4, in regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the flood, in the same flood of dispossession, speaking evil of you. Right? They, they, why, you, why don't you join us? The world will want you to conform to its ways. The idea of flood of disposition is the idea of running. They are going this way. Everybody's doing it. Everybody wants to go into these parties and, and, and let's drink and let's have all these things. Whether you are students, whether you are in uni, whether you are working person. What's the favorite pastime in Australia? Drinking. Right? This is the problem. And, and if you say, you know what? No, I'm, because I, I'm not going to be part of this. They will speak evil of you. Why are you, why are you so holy? Why are you, you are, you're better than us, are you? And they will speak evil of you. Now, we read. Okay? And then Peter says, they will give an account to him, God, who is ready to judge the living and the dead. They will give an account. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Now, the I, that, in other words, right, the Lord will judge. Okay? And our part is, you know what? These things, this is the world, this is the description, this is the dangers. And so many people just give in to go with the flow. Peer pressure, we call it. 
right? The struggle is real. <laughs> Whatever. Sure, why am I struggling? You know, all my friends are doing it. If I don't do it, they are they gonna, you know, nobody wants to be left out. Nobody wants to feel rejected. And because you don't want, you, you feel rejected, you know what, I, I'm going to go with that. I'll just be there, but I won't participate. I'll just watch. You're already there. In a moment of weakness, you can be part of it. No, you've got to understand the dangers of the world. And so last night, we talked about what it means to defend against the influences of the world. What do we have? We have a wonderful fellowship from God. We have a relationship with God. Build it up, nurture it, cultivate it, strengthen it. Would you defend? You know, I look at these young people, right? Some of them growing up talented. You know, they are just so full of potential. It is such a going to be a crying shame if the world takes them. Would you just sit there and let the world take them? I won't. I will do everything possible. If it meets whatever it takes to defend. That's what it means to be part of the fellowship. We defend each other. We defend it with faith, with love, with prayer. We reach out to each other. Defend. Right? So what did we have in camp? Wonderful fellowship. And I hope it continues post-camp. It is not just learning about God's Word. That is the, the source, the center. But the fellowship that is mentioned here. Nurture it, cultivate it. We are part of it. Get to know each other. We have one dear lady. She, you know, she, she, uh, she's uh, Madam Lim, much older lady. She has been coming every day. I mean, every day, to chop garlic, cut onions. From morning past lunch time, she just sits there every morning. I, I, I see her. She just. All the young people, I just, wow. She's just there. And she, she's there with, like a, with a mission. Tells the daughter, uh, Trevin, and, you know, I've got to come early. I've got to be there. And she's there working away. So saw her. She takes a bit of break, has a drink, and resumes cutting. Hi. That is amazing to see that. These are new people. These are just people who say, you know what, I, I, can, can I be part of this? Can I contribute to the fellowship in my little part, cutting something? She has contributed to the delicious meals that you are having. You know, this is what it means to have this fellowship. And we treasure it. And we nurture it. We cultivate it strongly. So good, Uncle William, you know, in the kitchen, apron, want to carry the pot and all, do it. Nobody, uh, well, I'm going to be there. I cannot just sit down and eat. Great. Each one, you know, you feel you have a part. Can I, can I do this part? Can I do part? Because, you know, I feel part of this fellowship here. I don't want to be part of the fellowship of the world. I have a fellowship that I belong to. With a fellowship, you have strength. If you're on your own, it is difficult to fight on your own. We were never meant to fight on our own. Defense, the picture here is that of strength in many. Okay, this is, this is the fellowship. So we'll really appreciate the different people who have taken time out. We don't want to be here to learn the songs, <clears throat> to lead in the songs, Treasure this. You know, this is something that we have. You already have it. What do you want to do with it? If God has blessed you, do we not know how to treasure it? 
there are young ones coming. Very young. And they're asking very interesting questions. But you know what? My joy is to give them an answer from the Scriptures. Let's reach out to them before the world reaches them. They are your children. They are our children too. Okay, we love them and we want to be there for them. You, you see this whole challenge of a youth camp? When every camp ministry we have is not another message. For me, it's never just another message. Been doing this for the past 11 years. And I just sat there this evening and I just said, wow, Lord. I mean, I don't think too much about it. It's just 11 years, but it's still 11 years. I still remember my first one. It was hard because we had to leave Christabel behind and my mother-in-law take care of her. It was the first time we ever separated from our daughter. It was difficult. She was only, she was still nursing, in fact. And I was missing her so much. And then one day, you know, one of the afternoon, uh, she came to church and I just, I just held her. This afternoon, I missed, missed the two kids. I really did. So I said, Aldine, I'm just going to go back for a little while. I wanted to surprise the kids. And I went back and I was surprised they weren't at home. <laughs> <laughs> they went out with the grandmother. <laughs> And I said, oh, well, yeah, go, go come back to church. <laughs> you know, they've grown up now. They've grown up now. The hard work, the power, you know, just to see, is it worth it all? Every year you watch the young ones grow. Of course, I see my daughter, she's 10 years old, so she's a reminder of how long I have been uh, ministering back at Bethel all the time. You grow with the church. And you see these little ones, once upon a time, they were the campers, like, you know, like cute, cute, like all you, Michelle and Grace and Emily, you, your age, Tabitha, all your age. And now they're leading the camp. My prayer is one day, you, you three of you, you'll be part of leading the camp. Can you imagine that far? They won't like you, don't know what's happening. Well, you know, and, you know, they didn't have... Words like the struggle is real, but it was other things. When they grew up now, we, we fought hard for them, okay? They didn't just remain. The world is always trying to reach them. And to hear Tamara come out here and stand, I will follow Christ. You just look at it and thank God it's worth it all. What will the next 10 years be like? And it's going to be generation after generation. You start with young people. And then now you've got not, not, not so young people. Wonderful. This is like family camp part two, except with no children. I told the committee, if the children came, you all will be, at the end of the camp, I will be conducting funeral services for all of them. They are already, oh, I'm just watching them, praying for them. Moses style. <laughs> Pray for them while well, they do battle. They're running around, doing everything. So I thank God for that. What am I defending? There is a picture in my mind. This is what I'm defending. Our faith, the church, from the grips of the world. Have we lost young people to the world? Yes, we have. To be very frank with you. We've lost some. And I determine everyone we lose, we say, we must lose no more. We work harder. You ask the Lord, help. Be there for us. Grow stronger. Grow wiser. Now, I don't know what version of the notes I'm in already. It's just past two, three. Just, you don't count. You keep working. You keep revising. Doesn't matter if you sleep late. You just keep, why? It's, this is defending. Tonight, I want to share with you this word, and it is a wonderful word, right? You got to know the dangers. You've got to say, you know what? I'm going to be part of this fellowship that will defend. Now, three, tonight, 
we're going to talk about. The, you've, we need a definite plan to fight off the influence of the world. If you don't have a definite plan, you don't know what's going to hit you. And over the years, you begin to realize you need a definite plan. We plan the church calendar. We do. We have family camp. We have youth camp. We have youth conference at the end of the year. We have all these things are planned for fellowship, for teaching, for mentoring, for discipleship. It didn't just come. You plan at it. You need a definite battle plan to fight off the influences of the world. You don't plan. If you have no plan for your children, if you don't have a plan for this, you are going to lose every single time unless you have a definite plan. Did John have a plan? Absolutely. I'm going to share with you three thoughts. And every, these three verses, three times he mentioned this, and the word is overcome. Right? Now, beginning with 1 John, let's turn back to 1 John chapter 2. <clears throat> See, he plans to write to them. You need this plan. By this, in this, I write to you. I write to you. I've written to you. This speaks of his plan. You've got to have a very definite plan. How to write, what to write. And then he says, I have written to you. Fathers, because you've known him who is in, from the beginning, I have written to you. Verse 14, 1 John 2, 14. Young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Can you overcome? Yes, there are the influences that are there, the sinful desires, the lust of the flesh, the the loss of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father. That's a key word, actually. Is not of the Father. What is not of the Father, of the world, there should be your warning signs. The pride of life. In other words, the arrogance of life. You boast about what you have. Is not of the Father. These are the sinful desires that are there and they will threaten you, and they will seek to, to get into you. This is what it is, right? Conformity to the way of the world, sinful desires. Now, there are sinful lifestyles too, 1 John 3, 6, right? There is speaking just like the world. You realize we can speak just like the world? And the world hears you because you speak just like the world. Be careful, right? You can end up speaking just like the world. Now, how do we overcome? What is the answer? How can we battle this plan? Do you plan to have the Word of God abide in you? Now, this is a, a series of statements connected with and you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. They must be connected. You can be strong, energized, empowered because the word of God is abiding in you. As the word of God is abiding in you, it remains in you, you have this strength to be an overcomer. Literally be an overcomer. How did Jesus overcome the temptations of Satan? Satan, look, if Satan has the audacity to tempt the Son of God, you are nothing to him. He will hit you. You please don't think, oh, but you know what? Satan won't tempt me 
because I've been a long-time church member, because I'm a leader in the church, because I have been so faithful. If Satan will tempt Jesus, you are certainly not spared. How did Jesus overcome? The Word of God remains in Him. Is God's Word, do you plan to have the Word of God remain in you? Not just read about it, not just high memorize, which we should, but it re really stays with you, that you can utilize it to overcome every temptation that is hurled at you. This, you are strong. The Word of God abides in you. You have overcome the wicked one. Second, 1 John 4, 4. <clears throat> Here is another verse that has the word overcome. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Who is in the world? Now, this context is the context of the spirit of the Antichrist. There is a spirit in this world that re rebels against Christ. Anything that is of the Lord, it will be anti against. That's the idea of an Antichrist. It will challenge that of Christ. It will refute that of Christ, either subtly or blatantly, all the same. It can come in a form of scholarship, not necessary. Please don't think, oh, it's, now it's not just drinking parties. There are scholars, there are teachers, there are professors that are totally against Christ. Anti-Christ. How do you overcome? Or are you defeated? He who is inside you is greater than he who is in the world, the spirit of the Antichrist. What is inside you? Do we have the Holy Spirit inside us? This is the power of the Holy Spirit. We can overcome the Spirit of God truly indwells us. One, the Word of God remains in us. Two, the Holy Spirit given to us. Right? This is, this is why it is so important to examine, am I yielding my heart, my life to walk with the Spirit of God? I'm not talking about, well, but I'm born again. God gave me His Spirit. Is He leading you? Is He empowering you? Is He bearing fruit in your life of the Spirit? Do you know what's inside you? Is it the Spirit of truth or the Spirit of error? The Spirit of God, of Christ, or the Spirit of the Antichrist? What's inside you? And we read, you are of God if we are truly of God. If you are a child of God, you know what you have inside you? The Spirit of God Himself. Are you a child of God? And you are an overcomer. Okay, and this is important. One, overcome by the power of the Word of God. Two, overcome by the power of the Spirit of God. Now, here's the third one. 1 John 5. And 1 John 5, verse 4, we read. Now, another verse that has mentioned a few times the word overcome. For whatever is born of God, again, this is, we're talking about being born again. You're born of God. You have received Jesus into your life. He has given you the right 
to become a child of God. You are born of God, right? Now, whoever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Faith in God. Right? Who is He who overcomes the world? But He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. What kind of faith do you need to be an overcomer? A faith that believes in Jesus as the Son of God. Huh? That's it? In other words, an ordinary believer can be an overcomer. You don't have to be a Moses. You don't have to be a Daniel. You don't have to be the Apostle Paul. You don't have to be the Apostle John. You just need to be an ordinary believer. He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God is an overcomer. Can we, can we see this? Can we understand this? Can we be encouraged by this? Can you overcome? The struggle is real. Why the struggle is real? Here is another one for you. The Lord is real. Why would I struggle? You know, the Lord is real. I'm a child of His. You know what? I can overcome. I have my Father's Word remain in me. I have His Spirit inside me. I have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm an overcomer. Am I not? All three things were given to Jesus. That's all He had. The Word of God, the Holy Spirit, faith. Same three things that God gives to us. As Jesus overcome this world, so can we. Can you overcome? Yes. When Jesus was on earth, his faith was the example of what it means to have faith in God. How real is that faith? How real is God? I am of God. Here is a child of God. You know, I've just finished this uh, book. It's called The Road to Unafraid by Captain Jeff Strucker. It talks about how the army's top ranger faced fear and found courage through Black Hawk Down and beyond. And it is really, I was really quite encouraged by how he overcame so many challenges in his life. Beginning when he was just a young boy. Seven years old, he was so terrified of death. As in so terrified, he can't sleep. And he would ask his family members, you know, uh, it, death was just so real to him. What happens when I die? Now, I had a question like that from one of the young people this morning about death. You think it doesn't? It's just for older, actually, for older people, is when, to die, when will I die? The fear is so real. Nobody could answer his question. A neighbor brought, uh, you know, shared with him the gospel, told him about Jesus, told him about eternal life in Jesus. And he knelt down in his bedroom and said, this was his prayer. God, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be of afraid of death anymore like I've been my whole life. I just want to know I'm going to heaven. Please help me. In Jesus' name, amen. That was a prayer of a 13-year-old. And he said, that same evening, that fear just disappeared. He's just not afraid anymore. You know, he became a teenager and he, he thought, you know what, I don't know what to do with my life. I'll join the army. And he did, and he joined in the infantry, and then he wanted to do something. He wanted to do something that would really impact the world. And he thought, you know, what greater way to really see the world and make a difference? Somebody told him, his friend, 
If you really want to make a difference, join the army. Well, he didn't know better, so he did. And so he went and joined Airborne Ranger. The training was drilling, and you know what? He overcame. There were many challenges. He, he became a ranger eventually. Under the, no, they, this is their quote, rangers leads the way. And so they trained them hard. They, all kinds of very difficult circumstances, they always send them first to clear the way and then send all the reinforcement to clean up everything, clean up the mess they made. No, these are the people who were sent first. And it was challenging. You know, just to see him, how he could apply his faith in God is just absolute, an overcomer. Can I apply my faith in the Lord? And army culture, Daryl was saying, army culture and being a Christian is, doesn't fit. Because they see Christians as too compassionate. To, to, if you are kind, you're compassionate, you're weak. And he said, I want to prove that to be absolutely a fallacy. I want to be the best ranger that there is, that I can be, and to show them I can be a Christian and a devoted one. Wow, I admire his faith. See, to talk about overcomer faith, I'm not going to be embarrassed about my faith in the Lord. So one night, they were going through a very, very grilling training. So this was the final test to see whether he would be able to lead a battalion, leadership course. And they were made to march through very little sleep, very little food. They only have some you know, ration packs with them. And then little food, little sleep, you're going to navigate. Raining, they say one, the, the final part, they got to go through the march hours on end. And so it was pouring down, and he was put on the spot. Strucker, lead the group out of here. And everybody, the morales were just totally defeated. It was Thanksgiving. All the, his fellow rangers was just longing, talking, crying. So he gathered everybody, they all huddled. And suddenly he said, I heard somebody sniffle. He thought maybe somebody caught a cold, but it wasn't. Suddenly his men were all crying. These were meant to be the strongest, toughest, bravest, and they were just broken mentally. We should be at home eating mummy's Thanksgiving turkey. What on earth are we doing here? You know, some thought of the turkey, some thought of the favorite pudding, some thought of, oh, they just, what? And so he said, you know what? At that moment, he said, I made a quick prayer. Lord, help me. I'm going to fail this leadership thing if I can't get my men, get their act together. And so he said, come on, man, let's huddle. He took out his, now they are starving, okay? He took out his, Ration that he saved, said, look, I'm going to share this with you. Right? Now, we've got to get this together, okay? Stop crying. <laughs> right? For starters, there's no payphone here. Do you see a payphone here? No. We're going to get through this. Right? And he led them out of it. While he went on to be a leader. He went on to overcome other challenges now. Before Somalia, he was posted to his first fight, battle. They all trained them. Panama, when the U.S. invaded Panama, he was there. And it was first time saw blood. Rangers can just die just like that. Bullets flying. He said, but at that time, he didn't think too much about it. Was he afraid of death? No. Went back, posted, right? And, but that moment shook him a bit. You see, when he wanted to join the army, he told his girlfriend, 
we cannot be together anymore. I'm going to join the army, and I think I'm, I'm going to look for my purpose in life, and I don't know how long it will take, so we cannot be together anymore. And she was brokenhearted. And so he went. And he said, at that moment, when I was so near death, I only thought of her. He said, if I survive this, I'm going to marry her. And he survived it. And so he survived. He went back to his hometown and he looked up the girl. And it was in a sister's wedding. And, well, they still liked, loved each other very, very much and asked for her hand of marriage. She waited for him. Don't know why. But there you go. <laughs> you know, it, but Dawn, she was a very, very devoted wife. You know, part of his being who he is was a godly woman by his side. Next thing, arrange marriage, plan. Okay, six months later, <sighs> posted this time Operation Desert Shield, which became Operation Desert Storm. As we know it, Iraq sending forces to Kuwait, and he was there. Again, now, he called up and he said to the fiancé, I've got something to tell you. I'm posted again. This time, I can't tell you where I'm going. I don't know when I'm going to come back. And I'm definitely not going to be, make it in time for the wedding. And he was waiting for the, on the other side to say, you know what? Forget about the wedding. But she said, oh, that case, we better get married next week. And he was, next week? Okay, you were right, right? And so he flew down, went back there, and got married. And then, of course, he was posted. And he survived that one and went back home. And he thought maybe, you know, being an army wife, and she, she was wonderful. She was there by his side. Understood where he's going to, what's going to happen to him. Uh, you know, understand all these things. You know, it's this challenge after challenge. What did he involve? He involved his faith. He involved God. He involved, you know what, I'm going to live by my faith. There were moments that were so difficult. He says one of the days when, no, when they are not posted, they are training constantly. And then he just, you know, beyond exhaustion. What comes to mind to just Find that strength to press on. You know what comes to their mind? It is, I mean, to us, it's so strange. But to them, it's so real. I'm a ranger. Their creed. And just to think this is who he is gives them that strength. You know what? If only that's what we think too. When we are just so, no, the, the battle is getting tough, the, the challenges are great, just to think, who are you? I'm a child of God. I will not be defeated. I'm an overcomer. See, this is why John wrote what he did. You are an overcomer. You have overcome. You are a child of God. This is who you are. This is your identity. I will overcome. Now, of course, the hardest one was when he was posted to Somalia. Mogadishu. At this point, it was a great famine that hit Somalia and many people were starving. I mean, it's on, it was on the news. The Marines were giving out food. UN, the UN were there distributing food. Mogadishu is the capital city of Somalia. It is controlled by warlords. Seven warlords in particular. They are like the gangsters. There is no law in that city. In the past, these warlords have no problem with the UN being there, except one. And he started to kill these, the, the UN uh, people, 24. And so US sent the rangers, again, sent people there to capture this guy. And that began his operation. His battalion was sent over 
to Mogadishu for that operation. It was meant to be a half an hour operation, right? They planned it out, everything, uh, set up the whole plan. He was leading the Humvees. Okay, place one, two, three, four, the corner. Fly in the birds, the helicopters. Fly in the Black Hawk. Load, bring down the rangers, right? Drop them uh, from the, repel them from the ropes. And it should be done, in, out, done. So he said, everything was going all right until one of the rangers, for whatever reason, he said, till, till today they don't know what happened, missed the rope and fell head first onto the ground. He receives a call. Strucker, we need you to get out there. We have a man down. And so they had to change plan. It was meant to be get the people, get onto the Humvee, get out. That was it. But this time, he had to go in, find the guy, bring him, get out. He thought 10 minutes, drive back, and then drive back into Mogadishu. In the streets should be fine. By the time he got the guy and he was driving out, he had the, he said, entire city, which felt like shooting at them with rockets, with AK-47, firing from roof, from every direction, and he is leading three Humvees out. Bullets were flying, and one of his best friends was killed in action. It was one of his good friends that was on the machine gun shooting. Told him, get up there, we've got to take down these guys. We're going to be killed here. And as he drove through, his friend was shot right in the head, killed instantly. Blood covered in the entire Humvee. That moment just shocked him. He's got a, he, he said, he just froze. And he, you cannot freeze when you're in the middle of a firefight. And he said, God, you've got to give me strength. And he drove and led the group back to base. Survived that. Managed, which was a miracle. And they say, at that point in time. Now, since 13 years old, he was really afraid of death. He has never been afraid ever since then. Not in Panama, not in Iraq, but he said, when I was cleaning the blood off the Humvee, suddenly I froze. Suddenly he realized that he could die instantly. And so he cleaned the thing off just before he finished. His, his, his commander calls him up and says, Strucker, you've got to get back out there. There are more men down. We have a black hawk that has just gone down. You've got to load the Humvee and get out there. We've got to retrieve the men. The guys that just came back, that just survived that, was not about to go back out. And they said, no, I'm not doing that. Some walked off. And he's calling them, hey, you're rangers. We've got to, we got to fulfill our mission. He said it, but in his mind, his heart tells him, you can't go back out there. You're going to die. You're going to die. You just survived coming back. You go out there, you are going to die. And so he, was, he said as he stood there, he prayed. And he said, God, I know I'm going to die probably in the next few minutes. I'm going to need your strength. And he said he remembered how Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knew he was going to die. How he found strength in God to do whatever he needs to. And if he were to die, and if he tells it is God's will, if this is your will, let this cup pass for me, but not my will, but yours be done. He remembered that prayer that Jesus made, and he made it his own. He said, that moment he settled in his heart, if I were to die, you know what? My eternity is secure. I will be with the Lord. And as if the Lord re brought his, his mind back to that passage, and as he thought about the Lord Jesus, 
how he faced death, he was ready to face death. He took his men, he loaded the Humvee, he went straight back out. What was meant to be a 30-minute mi mission turned into an 18-hour gunfight. Of course, the news never captured any of these things here. Only later it was reviewed. They only show that the, you know, there were people dragged out and the world was just confused. What, what's, what's wrong with these guys? Why are these people there? Then he had to explain. He, this is what actually happened. He went back in, twice, back in, brought more bodies, wounded out, and he went back again three times. No sleep, 18 hours, no sleep, no food. In, out. Then the third time, they managed to survive coming back. They actually, he survived it. He looked at the Humvee, riddled with bullets, literally. And he's wondering, how did I just survive that? The people who were with him all survived except his friend. The rest, many died. Many of them died. And he sat down and he was just stunned for a moment. He wasn't, he wasn't in shock. He was at peace. But what happened next changed his destiny forever. Suddenly, groups of men from his battalion who survived this, right? They used to be the one making fun of him. You Christian, you holy, why don't you join us? You are, you know, mocking him and he's just holding straight, not joining them in those drinking parties, nothing. These were the people that used to mock him coming to him and say, hey, Jeff, can I ask you something? If I die, where will I be? He said for the first time, he was actually having an opportunity to share the gospel with these fellow soldiers. And then the, the line, you know, there was a chaplain doing that, but he was just one of the soldiers and he was sharing with them how to find salvation in Jesus. That if they receive Jesus, their eternity will be secure. They will be a child of God. And it just flowed from him naturally and there became a long line. And then he felt that moment, you know what, maybe God is calling me to ministry. Well, he went back to his wife. He's, he's glad that he went back home to his wife. And he told, now this is going to be difficult because coming back, he's, he's now a, like, promoted. He's going to have a great career in the army, right? And you've led, and you've led well. You brought the men back. Good on you. His boss was really happy with him, and he's brought him to the office. You know what? We're going to, you know, put you here, pave the way for you to pr promote it. He was so heavy-hearted. He told his boss, Actually, I really would like to go into full-time ministry. His boss, he said his boss almost fell backwards and of course cursed at him. I said, what is wrong with you? You are going to throw away a very good career. You've got no college degree. You're just a soldier. Why don't you just be a good soldier? I know you're a Christian. Why don't you stay as a Christian? But why on earth would you want to do this? Say, I don't know, sir, but I feel God is calling me to do this, and I'm going to obey the Lord. And he did. It was very difficult because everybody's going to mock. Are you going to be embarrassed? Because people are now going to mock you. Oh, maybe he's suffering from, you know, post-traumatic thing, and he's gone soft. That's the assumption. You've just come back from a war. Maybe you've gone soft. He says, it's not gone soft. God has called me to something even greater, he feels. And so, he, though, he kept on training. He continued to be in the army, looking for ways where he could. He don't know what it is, but he wanted to do something. He wanted to go into ministry. He took courses, night courses, went to college, taught. Then he really overcome 
you know, they didn't have money. I mean, he's, they're just a young couple. They were a young couple, army couple, with children, with four children now. And his prayer is, Lord, if, if this is where you are calling me to, would you provide for me? You know what? He overcame challenge after challenge after challenge, not just in the war, but real life, at home, paying the bills. And that same faith enabled him to overcame, overcome this. Today, he serves as a pastor. He did go on to be a chaplain. He became a chaplain to the men he, they, that went to Mogadishu, was there beside them, there to encourage them, led many to Christ. You say, perhaps God is calling me to become a full-time pastor, not just a chaplain. It used to be rangers leads the way. Today, he puts down there, pastor leads the, pastors leads the way. <laughs> what it means to be a servant of God that would lead souls to Christ. Of course, his big ministry is to soldiers because he's been there. He understands how they feel. Not, none of us, you know, those of us who are not soldiers, it's very difficult. I mean, I can read this and I'm just thinking, some of the things I can't understand, why would they do that? But I admire that courage. And he's saying, you know, as he's taking the same principles of faith, it's no longer battle, but we are fighting other battles. Not out there in the war, but spiritual battle. Anxieties, worries of life. We worry about our children. We, we are battling for their life. It's the same principle of faith that we are overcomers. You are strong because the Word of God abides in you and you have overcome. This is his faith. And I thought, wow, this is exactly, in real time, an ordinary believer. Anyone, that's what John is saying. You don't have to be a Moses. It's not about being the great prophets. Anyone, any ordinary believer who possess genuine faith can be an overcomer. And he is just one such example from an ordinary soldier becoming the best in his field to becoming a servant of God. Overcome. Young people, can you be an overcomer? Can you? Don't say the struggle is real. Say the Lord is real. And He can be real to you tonight. Be an overcomer. I like this text. It doesn't just talk about an action of overcoming. And you should. One challenge after challenge, as you exercise faith, you can overcome, as this man did. But it's not just be overcoming as a verb. You become an overcomer as a person. It's inside you. You are an overcomer. And wherever you are, you are that overcomer. Whatever problems that you are faced with, you can overcome. With faith in God, with the Spirit of God that gives you wisdom, with the Word of God that guides you, with the Lord Himself, you can overcome. Be that overcomer. Begin. You see, Ask the Lord tonight, can I be that overcomer? Can I, can I apply this as a student? Yes, you can. Now, if you have fears in your life, you don't know what the fears are, and the, one of the greatest fears is the fear of death. Can that be overcome? He did. The Scriptures tells us that the Lord frees us from the bondage of fear. Fear is like a bondage. It grips you. It paralyzes you. It disables you. Let the Lord be your Lord. Let Him fill your heart, your mind. Let Him tell you, you are my son, you are my daughter, you are my child. You were born to overcome because you are born of God. 
what struggle? If God is for you, who can be against you? We are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. More than conquerors. Not just conqueror. The word conqueror is an overcomer in John's language. In Paul's language, we are more than conquerors. Through Christ, through God, through the Lord who loves us. Would you pray tonight? And ask that the Lord will be so real to you. That you will be that faithful child of His. You want to love Him. You want to draw near Him. You want to be that Christian unashamed. Walk with Him. You live by the code. You know what? I am a child of God unashamed. This is how I live. Every time you feel weakened, you remember who you are. Sinner saved by grace, born of God. I am a child of God. I overcome. Pray with me. May the Lord bless this word to your heart and create faith. That overcoming faith. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the gifts of faith. And in this faith, we can find ourselves to become overcomers. We thank you for your word. Let it abide. Let it remain in us. Let it be implanted and enable us to be that overcomer we were always meant to be. We are born of the blood that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have a great heritage. Help us to really be encouraged. To not be afraid of the challenges that be, are before us. To not be weakened when the battle gets tough. But to be invigorated by our faith, by your word, by your spirit, to overcome challenge after challenge after challenge, to truly lead the way as sons and daughters of yours. We ask that you would hear this, our prayer, and bless this word to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.